what a great name. Well, I've titled the message of our text this morning, The New and Improved. The New and Improved. And our text that we just read earlier is found in Matthew chapter 9, and we read earlier verses 14 to 17. If we were to stop and push the rewind button on this chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, you will remember and you, we, you'll understand and know that we, we heard the Lord telling the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And you remember that that made those guys that I refer to as the religious snobs very angry. And then we saw in our study of the Gospel of Matthew that our Lord was eating with tax collectors and other sinners, it says. He had gone to Matthew's house. He, Matthew had been at his tax booth. Jesus looked at him. You remember we read last week, and he only said two words to him. He said, follow me. And Matthew left it all and followed Jesus. And then Jesus, Matthew did something that, that we need to do. He had a meal for Jesus. He had lunch, and he invited his friends in, those other tax collectors and those other sinners, and, and he shared with them with Jesus, and Jesus was their main focal point. And as I told you last week, that even made the religious snobs even angrier. And now in this passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, these same guys, these religious snobs, but also John the Baptist, his, his disciples were there, and I don't think they were as angry as the religious snobs. They were just confused. They didn't understand. And we're going to see that this is their third point of criticism of our Lord. Now, whenever we study a parable in the Gospels that Jesus is speaking about and speaking of, it's like peeling an onion, okay? Imagine you have an onion in your hand, and you're going to peel that thing. Every one of us knows that when you peel an onion, it, there's different layers to it. And as we study these parables, I want us to visualize that onion. The first layer that we peel away in the parables is what I refer to as surface truth. It's the natural story that Jesus is talking about, that he's telling about. The next layer in the onion that we peel away is the spiritual truth. And that's the part that lays just below the surface, but this is the timeless spiritual meaning that applies to all Christians throughout history. Now you're going to go a little bit deeper. And then you're going to get into the next layer, and this is the personal truth. This is the part that it directly applies to you and me and what we need to do with it. So that's what we're going to see this morning. The first thing that the Lord talks about is a wedding celebration. John the baptizer, his disciples fasted regularly, as did the Pharisees. The, uh, the Pharisees were probably no doubt upset that Jesus' disciples were not fasting like they did. John the baptizer, his disciples were, were wondering why they didn't, bab uh, they didn't fast like he, his guys did. And they were unsure of that, and so they, they, they asked Jesus why this happens. And you remember, if you've studied the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they fasted two days a week, okay? But when they fasted, they fasted in a way that was an outward appearance, an outward appearance only of, of how holy they were, how good they were how religious they were. They weren't fasting for the real reason of getting closer with God. If you have ever done a real fast, you know that you have spent that time when you were eating, doing what? Praying and reading the Word of God. Growing closer and 
moving to, closer to God. These guys didn't do that. They did it at, as an outward sign. And they wanted to everybody to think how spiritual they were, how holy they were. And, and fasting, really, if you've ever done it, you know that it is a, a, a spiritual wonder. It's amazing to, to fast and to focus that time on God. And, and it's not a ritual designed for other people to know that you're doing it. Now, you'll remember, if you've studied the Old Testament, that the Old Testament commanded the Jewish people to fast, but one day a year. And that was on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, that the, that the nation of Israel was to fast. But again, these disciples, or these, uh, these Pharisees, they took something that was a wonderful spiritual act of spiritual discipline, and they turned it into a badge almost of being a super self-righteousness. Look at me, how great I am. I fast two days a week. Yeah, we know that the Old Testament, we know the Bible says only, we only have to fast one, but we fast two days a week. We are so much holier than you all. And, and, and so, in answering their criticism, the Lord compares himself to a bridegroom. Okay? So let's go to the surface truth. People do not fast at wedding parties. What do they do? They feast. Right? I've never seen anybody go to a wedding reception and when it comes time for the meal, the person says, oh, no, I'm fasting. I'm fasting about this wedding. I'm not going to eat. Man, you better get out of some people's way. When the preacher has said the prayer for the, for the meal and they do that. And I've been to some great weddings. Not only as a Christian, but as a pastor, I've been to some beautiful weddings. And, and beautiful wedding receptions. But if you study a Jewish wedding, the most elaborate American wedding is kind of dull compared to a Jewish wedding. The wedding feast is a climax of a year of, in the Jewish beliefs of their, what they call betrothal. That time of expectation and planning for, for a much more involved than in encouragement period. Following the actual wedding ceremony, there's a full week. Imagine this, moms, dads, if you've got daughters, you ready for this? Imagine a full week of eating and dancing and singing and celebrating that is taking place and you pay for it all. A full week. Now, after the ceremony, that's what the Jewish couple did. They hung around of that full week and celebrated and all their friends and all your family came in and they, they, they celebrated the marriage of your son or your daughter. In America, after the wedding the, and, and the pastor says the I do's and they, the bride and the groom eats a little bit, man, they jump in the car and jump, go to the airport and go. Not in a Jewish wedding. They would stay for that full week. And the bride and the groom would be treated like a king or a queen. In olden days, they even wore a garland crown on their head to distinguish themselves as a bride or a groom. And this was their week. And, and for a lot of times, back, especially back in biblical days, in Jesus' day when he walked this earth, this was the best week of their lives the best week. They're, they're, the friends of the bride and the groom, they, folks, listen, they did some serious partying. It wasn't a time for fasting and looking all downtrodden. It was a time to feast. Now, that's the surface truth. Let's go that little bit deeper and get to the spiritual truth. The the. The next layer is this. You cannot live under grace and law at the same time. The Word of God says in John chapter 1 and verse 17, For the law was given through Moses. 
Grace and truth was realized through Jesus. I don't know about you, but if you've studied the Old Testament and you've studied the law of the Jewish nation, beloved, listen, we are to hit our knees right now and thank God that we do not live under the law. Now, do we obey the Old Testament? Well, sure we do. Do we pitch it away? No. But I am thankful that I live under grace. So thankful. Living under the law, basically and truthfully, was a burden. You could only walk so far. You could only do so much. You could only go here so far and all like that. Because, and it became a burden. But living under grace liberates us. And the Lord identified himself in this parable as a bridegroom and his disciples were the guests. They were his wedding party. And while they were there with him, they acted happy instead of all somber. They were having fun. I do not believe that when Jesus walked this earth, and I've said this to you many, many times, when our Lord walked this earth and the disciples were with him, I don't think that, had, one, that they had glowing halos over their head, and I don't think they always had long faces, and I don't believe that they had their hands folded in front of themselves all the time. These were men that loved life. And I believe with all my heart, and I'm not being disrespectful one bit, but I believe when our Lord and the disciples were sitting around those fishing campfires, I believe they talked and I believe they laughed and I believe they joked with one another. And I've almost got a sneaking feeling that sometimes our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, being a man, picked on old Peter and kind of used him as that example. Now, I'm not being disrespectful at all, but they loved life. And while the disciples walked with Jesus, it was a time to celebrate. It was a time to be happy. And there's an important truth for you and I as Christians. The Christian life for us should be more like a wedding celebration than a funeral procession. And the real reason why the Pharisees were so upset with Jesus through all this of chapter 9 was that they thought it was not fair that his guys, Jesus' disciples, enjoyed life when they had to endure their religion. That's what religion does. It puts a burden on you, and you have to endure it. Christianity, like I said, it liberates you, and it gives you joy from within. Amen? See, the Pharisees believed that if you were really holy, you were miserable because you had to endure it. And Jesus' disciples were not miserable like they were. The Pharisees were griping and Jesus' disciples were grinning. The Pharisees were somber while Jesus' disciples were singing. The Pharisees were criticizing while Jesus' disciples were celebrating. And they couldn't understand that. Now that leads us to the next layer, and that's the personal truth. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your life should be characterized by a joyous relationship with the Lord instead of legalistic rituals. Amen? I have been observing Christians for many, many years, starting out the day that I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. I saw other Christian people, and I wanted to see how they lived their lives. And some of them, it didn't take this boy very long when I became a Christian to realize that I did not want to be like them. And there were these over here that, man, I wanted to be like because they enjoyed their Christianity. They loved the Lord. They loved to tell people about Jesus Christ. And those men were the ones that I wanted to be my mentors. 
They're the ones that I wanted to be like. So we need to watch how we live. Like the Pharisees, there, there's people in the church today, they believe that the more miserable they look in church, the more holy they are. That how dare you come into church and smile. Well, if you can't smile in church, then you don't need to smile anywhere. Because we have come to church to worship and to praise Almighty God. And if I'm praising God and I'm worshiping God, beloved, I'm not going to have a frown on my face. I'm going to have a smile on my face. And thank God for what He's doing. Now, the Lord was not forbidding His disciples that they would never fast. Okay? Because you remember we read earlier, He said after His death, that when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then in those days they will fast. But for right now, they needed to celebrate with him. They needed to walk with him. It was so much, I want to share with you a little bit more of what those Pharisees would do. When the Pharisees would fast their two days a week, they went so far as to put ashes on their head. And they would go around the streets of Jerusalem or wherever and moan. How would you like that? They did that so everyone would know how spiritual they were. In Matthew's Gospel, if you have your Bible, open back up to Matthew's Gospel and go to chapter 6. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, look down at verse 16 with me. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. That's the Pharisees. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Now Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse 17. He says, But you, who's the you? Us. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. If I am fasting or if you're in fasting, fasting, nobody should know it. Oh, your spouse might because they're with you there in the house. But nobody else should know it. You don't put ashes on your head. I don't, you don't come in here and moan and groan and all like that or walk down the street of St. Genevieve or wherever you live and moan and groan. So people say, oh, look at this one. They must be fasting. They are so spiritual. No. Jesus says, don't let anybody know. We as Christians, beloved, I believe this with all my heart, we should have joy in our hearts so much, joy in our hearts so much because what Jesus Christ has done for us, that if an unsaved person looks at you and they know you're a Christian, they will say in their hearts, I want what they have. Or if it's a younger Christian, they look at you and see how you live your life and how you walk this earth. They say, when I get older in my faith, or maybe even now, I want to have what they have, that relationship with God, that closeness with God. I can tell you this, since my day of salvation unto this day, I have had more fun, more laughs, more joy in my heart than I did in any of the years that I had lived before Jesus Christ. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ did within my heart. Well, let's look at the second parable that Jesus speaks about in there, our text. And this is the new patch on old clothes. Guys, I don't know if you were like me, but in, in, when I was a kid, I always had patches on the knees of my blue jeans. My poor mother, she would buy me a pair of blue jeans 
and she'd say, Bruce, you keep these for school and don't you dare wear them. Because when you go to school, I want them to look nice. Well, Bruce wouldn't wear them till the school. Well, of course, like any boy, I wanted to play softball. Now, when I'm playing softball, I play to win. And if that meant that I had, even though I had my new blue jeans on, if I had to slide in second base or third base or home plate, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to slide. And guess what happened sometimes? My blue jeans tore, and I would come home, and I'd say, Mom, I was playing ball today, and look what happened. Set up the ironing board. You remember you used to be able to buy those, I don't know if you still can or not, you used to be able to buy those, they were blue denim-like, and mom, poor mom, bless her heart, she'd have to iron that patch on there. I'd go, Mom, I don't want to go to school with those things on there. Your blue jeans, you wear them, unless you want to buy some new ones. Man, I got up and I wore them. Okay? So, we're talking about new patches on old clothes. Now, the surface truth is this. A new patch on old clothes will ruin the patch and the clothes. Not so much today, but back in Jesus' day. Today they're made out of synthetic fibers. And they don't shrink. It'll, it'll even say on a lot of things, it will say, will not shrink. But in our Lord's time, the new clothes always shrank because of the material that they were made of. And especially after the first couple washings, they would shrink down. And so whenever a man would have his wife make his garment, they were always a couple sizes too big for him. But he knew that as soon as the wife washed him, or if he washed him, they would shrink down and then they would fit him. And they were the right size. And in our Lord's time, they always got torn, just like our clothes do. In our Lord's time, they got moth-eaten. And so... The missus of the house was always constantly repairing the robe. And if you had a hole in the old robe, it was foolish to sew a new patch of clothes on it. Because what's going to happen? As soon as hub, husband gets his robe dirty and the missus goes to wash it, guess what's going to happen? The old clothes is going to stay the same because they've been through the washer a couple of times. But that new patch is going to do what? It's going to shrink. And then what happens? You've got this tear. You've got this rip. And the result is both the patch and the old robe is totally ruined. Well, let's look at the spiritual truth. The Lord did not fix the old covenant. He introduced a new covenant. All right? In the parables, the old garment was a representation of the Old Testament, the old covenant. It's what we call the law. And the Lord was saying he didn't come to improve the new covenant, he or the old covenant. He came to replace it with something totally new. You no longer live under the law. You now live under grace. And I'll tell you what, we are to all shout amen on that one. <laughs> Okay, And there was no way that his new covenant could be used as a new patch on the old one. Aren't you glad that we do not have to do all the animal sacrifices? I am so glad that we do not have to do that. We had one sacrifice for all, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. And here's the great thing. I don't have to go back day after day, year after year, and reconfess my sins and re-invite him into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I did it one time, and that's good. Now, do I sin from then to now? Yes. But do I nail him back up on the cross? No. Do I confess those sins? Yes. But it's not the same as the time that I first accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay? And see, the Pharisees, they were threatened by this, by this new teaching. They lived their whole life based on keeping the law. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad enough that they couldn't even keep the Ten Commandments, but they started adding their own laws to it and had many, many more. 
and their lives were based on keeping the law instead of living under grace. Now let's go a little deeper. Personal truths. The Lord wants to pat, does not want to patch up your, your old life. Okay? He doesn't want to patch it up. You know what he wants to do? He wants to give you a new life. That's what he wants to do. Some people say, well, I'm pretty good, and I only need the Lord just to patch up some areas of my life, and I'll be done with it. That's not the truth. The tr truth is, is that the Lord didn't come to patch up your heart. He came to give you a new heart. He didn't come to reform your life. Beloved, listen, He came to transform your life. I am transformed to the guy that I was before September the 11th, 1971. I'm glad He just didn't reform me. I am so thankful that He transformed me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's writing to you and I. And listen to what he says. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is that you? Are you in Christ? It is if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior. He is a new creation. Old things pass away, Behold, new things have come. From the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation created by God. You're not the same old person you once were. Okay, let's look at the final parable that Jesus is talking about in our text. New wine and old wineskin. Spiritual truth. I mean, uh, surface truth, surface truth. New wine will crack and bust hardened old wineskin. It will do it. Now, you find wine in stores today, and what are they in? They're in bottles, okay? But in the time of the Lord, the wine was most often stored in goat skin. These skins were scraped clean, they were tanned, they were heated over fire. Then the, the skin was uh, stitched back together. And all the time, or many of the time, the neck of the skin became the spout of the wine bottle, or the wine skin. And fresh wine, was, wine skin was soft, and when the new wine was poured into it, gases formed. And that they were released from that process of that fermentation. And the new wineskin, because it was still soft enough, it could stretch and accommodate that expansion and then harden after the wine in it fermented. Now the religious leaders and everyone that was listening to Jesus say that, they knew what would happen if you put new wine into old wineskin. After a few days, the old wine would wine skin would crack and split and the stitches would come apart and all that brand new wine that you just made would pour out all over the floor and it was wasted. The deeper meaning of this, and this is part two, or layer number two, is the spiritual truth. Listen to me carefully. The Christian life is a constant growing of new revelation of the truth of Jesus Christ and new ways to share the gospel. Let me ask you this. When I talk about the revela new revelations of truth, do you know more today than what you did when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I hope you do. And they were new revelations of the truth. Why? Because you were studying the Word of God. The only thing I knew when I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was that He loved me and He forgave me of my sins. I then learned that there was an Old Testament and a New Testament. I wasn't that keen back then. 
And then in the New Testament, I found out and I learned that the first four books that we call the gospel. Then you have the, what's called the Pauline epistles. Then you have all the way back and you have the letters of John. And I kept learning and kept learning and kept learning new revelations and new knowledge, really, of Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. And I also learned how to tell people new ways about telling people about Jesus Christ. In some ways, work better with other people. But see, the religious snobs of the Lord's day, they didn't like his teaching because it was almost revolutionary to the way that they did it. After all, this man named Jesus, who was a rabbi, would sit and eat and drink with sinners. They wouldn't do that. I've told you before, and I'll say it again today, that when a Pharisee was walking down the street and his wife was coming toward him on the same side of the street, he, when they got almost face to face with each other, even though they were going opposite directions, he was so pious and so holy that he would not even acknowledge her or nod to her because it was seen as something not proper. And here Jesus sits in the home of Matthew eating and drinking with other tax collectors and whoever those other sinners were. And to them, they just could not accept that. They could not handle that new wine that the Lord was offering, that living under grace instead of under the law. And like old wineskin, they had become so inflexible that every time the Lord said something or did something new, you could almost, if you were around them, you could almost hear the sound of the straining and the stretching uh, and, and almost the, hear the, hearing the, uh, the stitching break in their lives. They just couldn't handle it. Our Lord is the new wine, and he came to bring something new and improve. Now, I know there's a lot of people that they like and they prefer the old ways and the old routines, but God loves new things, folks. Listen, let me tell you this. When we enter the Christian life, we call it through the what? The new birth. Do we not? It's new. It's not like the old. And Paul, and I just wrote, read to you, Paul says that we become a new creation. There's that new again. And we walk, as the scripture says, we walk in newness of life. And even then, and even more, one day God will create a new heaven and a new earth. They'll do away with the old and we'll have the new. Jesus says over in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things And these Pharisees couldn't deal with it. They couldn't handle it. I've been in some churches, as I know you have, and you do certain things at a certain time, and don't you dare get out of that pattern. You do the offering here, you sing these many songs, you have the scripture reading, you do so many songs, and the preacher gets up, he preaches, they do the benediction, and you go home. And it's that way forever and ever and ever. Amen. I've always joked with the people of this church. I said, one of these days, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to welcome everybody. We might do the offering, and then I'm going to preach, and then we'll sing the songs. Just to be different. Just to see something new. And just from my vantage point of being up here, just seeing the shock on faces. But see, the Pharisees, those, those religious people, they couldn't stand that. They couldn't put up with that with Jesus. I mean, he stood there and talked to Matthew. He went into Matthew's home. 
He talked to the prostitutes. They couldn't stand that. They would have never done that. Now, let's go to the third point, the third layer, and this is the personal truth. If we are not careful, or I put it this way, if you allow your heart to harden, it will be difficult for you to accept new ideas. If you allow your heart to harden, it will be difficult for you to accept new ideas. The Lord Jesus was addressing an attitude that resisted anything new. And I know we have, some of us have a tendency to reject any new ideas whatsoever. We like the old way. Well, beloved, I hate to say it, but sometimes the old way doesn't work. I remember in the day that you used to be able to walk down the streets of St. Genevieve or DeSoto where I grew up and you could go into communities and knock on people's doors and they would invite you in and you could tell them I'm from Grace Baptist Church and I would like to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ and they'd say come on in. Now I'm not saying they'd accept Christ but they'd at least allow you in. There are some areas of the country that you do that today, you get to the, about the second or third door and the police are going to be there. So we have to learn new and inventive ways of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ so many different ways. I doc I've used Dr. D. James Kennedy's method. I've did the Roman road. I've done the four spiritual laws. I've done a, one program that, I, that was called the Bridge to Life. And now what I've done is kind of incorporated all of them together and done my own of sharing Christ with people. But there are some people that say you can only share Christ this way. Or you can only use, as we talked earlier in our Sunday school hour, there is only one Bible that you use and preach out of. And if you don't preach out of that one certain Bible, you are a heretic. Because it's the way we've always done it. Those are the last words of a dying church. You know that? The last words of a dying church is we have never done it that way before. You just put the final nail in the coffin. Because we, I, now, listen, those of you that know me, you know what I'm saying. We never change the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never. We teach and preach the blood of Jesus Christ and that he died on the cross and that he was buried and that he rose on the third day and that he ascended into heaven and that's where he is right now, standing at the right hand of God. That never changes. And I've always told the churches where I've been at, if you want to change that, count me out and I will see you later. Okay? But sometimes... We have to change the approach of how we do it. That's what we have to change. And sometimes, beloved, we get so set in our ways that, that our, our hearts and our minds, they, it's almost as if they calcify until we are so inflexible. Now, my question to all of us today is, what kind of person are we? Are we one of those like the Pharisees that we are so inflexible that nothing new or anything new is totally wrong and we are to just throw it out? Or do we and are we like people that says, hey, you know, that might not be the way I did it, but it's good, it's biblical, let's do it, that. let's try it. We did a thing some years ago here, and some of you that have been here for a while remember this. We did a thing where we walked through the community and we handed out bags, they were in the wrappings, of microwave popcorn. Remember that? And we had a little label put on there and we said, we hope you pop in. And I remember the first time I ever did that, not here but at another church, they said, well, we've never done that. Let's try it. 
and we head on there. We hope you pop in, and we gave Grace Baptist Church of St. Genevieve. We gave the Sunday school hour. We gave the morning worship hour. We gave the Wednesday night Bible study hour on there, and we gave it out. Something new. But see, I've been in some churches that you would have never done that. What kind of people are we? Are we so inflexible that we've got to do it the way we did it for the past 40 years, even though it never achieved anything? But we're going to keep doing it because it's tradition. Or are we willing to say, hey, as long as it's spiritual, as long as it's biblical, we'll try it. It may not work, but we'll try it. Well, let me conclude with this. Let me ask you a question. What is God saying to you? Do you need to stop acting like the Christian life is a funeral and start acting like it's a celebration? Because, beloved, that's what it is for me. My Christianity is a celebration. I'm celebrating what God did for me. Folks, listen. Before I was dead in my sins, now I am fully alive. And when my days on this earth is over, I'm going to heaven. And that is something to celebrate. Do we need to stop trying to patch up our, our old life and allow the Lord Jesus Christ put a new life in us, put a new robe on us of his righteousness? Have we stopped growing in Christ and, and have we stopped changing? See, I don't want to be the same Christian I was back on September the 11th, 1971. I don't want to be that same Christian. I want to be further along in my faith. I want to be stronger in my faith. Don't you? I pray you do. We can't be, when I started my Christian life out, I was a baby in Christ. I didn't know anything. I depended on everybody to do everything for me. Now, do I still need people? Yes. I still need people to encourage me and to uplift me and motivate me. But I need to be walking in the Lord, too. And reading my scriptures, reading the scriptures and and reading my Bible, and I need to be praying. But sometimes I need you all to encourage me to do that and to help me walk even closer. I don't want to stop changing because when you stop changing and when you stop becoming new in your faith and walking a new way, you, you become stagnant. Or have we become like the old crusty wineskins that we are so set in our ways that if anything new comes along, we're just going to bust. If God has been speaking to you about something in your life that you need to get straightened with him, I encourage you right now, and we're going to give you a few minutes. It's going to be total silence in here, I hope. You praying to God. If God is speaking to your heart, then you speak to him. If God is calling you to do something, then, beloved, do it. If God says you need to change this in your life to have a closer walk with me, then do it. If you need to start celebrating your Christian life and your Christian walk, then, beloved, start celebrating it. It's a joy. It's a joy. Well, let's take the next few minutes, and if God has been speaking to your heart, you speak to him. If God is calling upon you to do something, then, beloved, let me encourage you to please do it. Be obedient and do as he tells you to do. And then I'll close this in a word of prayer. Let's pray.
Father God, I pray that you speak to hearts today. And that you lead us and you guide us. Father God, speak to us about our walk with you. Help us to always be walking with you. To not be in the same that we were the day that we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. But help us to change, to, to walk closer with you. Father God, I pray that you, that you will speak to our hearts and you will show us, Father God, that our Christianity is a joy. It's a celebration like that wedding feast, not a funeral. And that we should show that joy, that we should reflect that to other people, that, that people need to see that even though we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we still love life. And that we can still have good old clean fun. And we can laugh and have a good time. Father God, I pray that however you are speaking to hearts, that those hearts are speaking to you and that they will obey your spirit promptly and quickly. I pray, Father God, that you lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray.